chemicals. Now, I'm, the comments I'm going to make are through the lens of a, someone who does risk assessment, okay? And where I'm going with this is um, this is very elegant, basic science. And the question before the House is one question is how can we use this basic information uh, to help people make societal decisions about chemicals? So um, it, it comes down to translational risk assessment, let's call it that. Now, um, I'm going to walk through these three questions that you pose to the, the panel here. Uh, the short answers are yes, maybe, and yes. Um, <laughs> I said I'd be succinct. Okay. The first one, I, th I think the one that, that is increasingly on my mind has to do with uh, silver nanomaterials, several nanoparticles. And uh, with regard to um, chemicals that can um, influence bacteria, are intended to influence bacteria. And I got to thinking about this with that uh, cartoon about the, 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 per the person who was asking for the salad. Um, and the bacteria wanted a hamburger and french fries. Well, you might go with the hamburger and french fries, actually, because how many of you in this room have purchased a prepackaged salad in a plastic bag in a grocery store lately? Okay, me too. Well, if you've noticed, that plastic bag is actually not like your usual plastic bag. And in fact, it's actually a high-tech material. And the reason they're using it, apparently, is that it, it has silver nanomaterials incorporated into it to preserve, keeps, turns out the bugs don't like these things. And so it keeps the salad fresh. So you may want to think about Thank that. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> don't blame me, blame the CPSC, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, where I'm going with this, though, is that, that well, this is, a, this is another issue. I mean, this is not, not a microbicide in the usual sense of a microbial side or what we think of it. But in fact, uh, CPSC has estimated that there are 600 categories of things in commerce right now that have nanomaterials in them, not just silver nanoparticles. But they taste great and they're glass filling. <laughs> okay. okay. It, moving quickly along. Um, Number two, I guess it, we, we've kind of gone back and forth on what's, what's an adverse effect um, and adverse to whom. Um, I was fascinated by the, uh, the one slide that had to deal with uh, changes in the uh, flora, I'll call, use the old term, an old fashioned kind of guy, in the microbiome in older persons. Okay, um, and from the point of view of risk assessment, that, that we recognize that various life stages, let's call them, have different kinds of risks associated with them. If indeed uh, you could begin to make a linkage between changes in that microbiome in older persons who are generally more sensitive, and I'm starting to take this personally myself actually, um, you, could, you could begin to recraft risk assessments um, and begin to tailor them, I think is really what I want to say, um, to become more focused on populations at special risk. There's, there's, there's a kind of joke in risk assessment about the man who drowned in the swimming pool whose average depth was two inches. And, but what we recognize is that there are individuals within the population who are especially sensitive um, to chemicals, either as a result of age, life stage, diet, nutrition, what have you. I, I think the microbiome just quite simply hasn't been plugged into this, and I think it should be. I'll just say it that way. Now, the, the idea that um, you could have an adaptive response that could become adverse. Um, there's an interesting concept um, in, uh, has to do with retroviruses actually, that um, retroviruses may actually represent a kind of uh, vehicle of evolution. In other words, they're capable of injecting a uh, modified genome into the host cells. And, and the thought was that, well, maybe the reason they can do this is that their normal purpose is that they can be modified by UV light 
other kinds of environmental factors like that. But they could also be modified by chemicals um, such that instead of conferring a positive effect, it actually becomes something like a negative effect. So it's sort of a multi-step process. I'm just hypothesizing that or tossing it out for your consideration. And then the final thing is three. Um, it has to do with, the, we've discussed this business of the widespread use of antimicrobials, uh, conventional ones. And it's it's tr very clear from the discussion we've had this morning, but it's also very clear for these multi-drug resistant bacteria that that have have evolved. And are, uh, my understanding is that um, the physicians and the other people who deal with infectious diseases, this has become an increasingly thorny issue for them, um, from the point of view of having to be being able to pull another. Um, antimicrobial out of the out of the hat that can deal with these kinds of organisms so I know um, and I'm going to stop right there that was three well I wanted to second the uh, congratulations to all the speakers and the organizing committee I think it was a very interesting day and especially to me the third session as I was listening through um, these last presentations especially I was trying to put my uh, um, study section member hat on and think of how this may fit into a uh, modular five-year grant budget. And I simply could not wrap my brain around this uh, just because of the realities. And then again, and the, whether it's a, well, no, modular is, OK. I'm sorry. For those who are not living in the, in, in, in the rest of the world, that's um, $250,000 a year for five years or less. Uh, and, um, you know, whether it's a regular study section or a special emphasis panel, I think that, that these types of um, projects are really trying to integrate the cross because I think that very neat science is being done within each specific area. And I think what is badly needed is, is integration. And, um, and I think, again, it's up to the institute to decide on, you know, what to do with this particular issue next and how to lead the way. Uh, but what I think personally is an opportunity here for the institute, especially with the uh, clinical unit and, uh, again, the human studies at the EPA, where I think this is clear, even though I'm an experimentalist in animals and in vitro, I think this is clearly a, a human problem that probably can be modeled to some degree but cannot be addressed in animals just because we're going across too many bridges here. And especially what Linda mentioned uh, with some really large initiatives on um, you know, children health, children's health and others where there is still an opportunity to kind of add an arm or a small dimension to all the sample collection that is being conducted right now and is just being started, I think this is where the Institute may be uh, really showing some leadership and uh, integrating across the intramural and extramural communities. And because I really can't think that a project that or projects that can lead the way can go through the regular study section because they're just a little too large in scope and too diverse for a particular study section to grasp. Can I just respond to that a moment? Um, it seems to me that some of these things are perfect for program project kind of possibilities um, just just to think about because clearly there is an increasing need for multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary kind of efforts that you can't do within a single grant. Right. Although the institute is not, the NIHS doesn't have a great track history of funding program projects. Stay tuned. <laughs> so. Could I make a comment, John? Um, sure. Why don't we open it up at this I'm point? Or, I'm sorry. Listed, but that's okay. I'll just be the first to speak not on the panel. How's that? <laughs> or um, on the panel, please. Or the last to speak on the panel. I'm sorry, Vince. <laughs> that's okay. A number of us in the room were meeting with Lita Proctor and other members of NIH and many of the NIH program officers thinking about what's the next stage in the potential human microbiome project after HMP 1.0. And I think you just brought up one of the topics that was discussed heavily and the idea of does there need to be some sort of cross, even interagency type of activity that 
brings together some sort of resource, and it's not clear, we could never really decide what that was, that would facilitate it so that people who potentially did have a project that fits in the modular budget with the assistance of something else that was centralized, codified, standardized in terms of perhaps a resource and bioinformatics, et cetera, allowing people to do this type of research. Because the question was, should we fund infrastructure to look at the microbiome? Should we pick certain projects that look at certain aspects of the microbiome? And which is the most efficient and effective way to get results that might be useful? And unfortunately, we didn't, did we? We didn't come up with any answers yet, did we? Yeah, actually, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that what, what was decided there was that we, we just are so at the beginning of this whole thing that we just, you know, I, I personally and a lot of other people around felt that we th should throw the kitchen sink at it. In other words, you know, we should just really make an extra effort from all directions to try to, get, to shed some light on how this might be working. Um, I think this is a, a great discussion to be having about the research implications of what we're hearing, um, but I do want to remind everybody that there is a s dedicated panel to this tomorrow, and I oh, think there are probably a fair number of questions still related to, I certainly have a few, if nobody else does, uh, related to the environmental health implications and interaction. So if we can, if we can bring it back, and it's, I, don't, I, I don't want to take away the rest of your time. You are such a dedicated panel member. You have at least four more minutes. Um, so. Well, actually, when I looked at the questions, the one thing that struck me about it is that um, as much as I love the bugs, a lot of it was focused on the bugs and how can this change the microbiome in the first question. And again, ex environmental exposure can cause the microbiome to change and what's the effect of all of this on the microbiome, which is all heartening to me. But again, as we've heard from a number of the discussants, it's sort of a two-way street. And we also have to then turn it back around, you know, occupational environment can affect the microbiome, and we already have had many years, decades of research on how environmental exposures can affect the host. And then what is the sum total of both of those changes to the host, either genotoxicity, changes in host metabolism, how does that change the interaction of the host with the microbiome in, again, a more complicated manner than looking in a linear fashion, that you actually have a network of interactions between the metabolism of the host, the metabolism of the microbiome, and to follow up with Dr. McFall Nye's, you know, uh, exhortation that we look at this as a whole system and consider it as yet another organ system and can just consider how we would not necessarily, when looking at toxicity, we bring in the cardiovascular system because we look at the circulation of toxicants and then we look at the GI system because of absorption and also because of the liver and then if there are neuro neuro neurologic effects, you know, we kind of put all of that together and I think that's why the answers to the questions were yes, maybe, and yes, is because they're all sort of tied together. And I think that approaching this sort of systems approach to this kind of question and looking at it, just adding this to, and I'm, I'm again pushing that concept that there is a role for reductionist science, because that's what I was taught to do, and we still do it, but because of emergent properties of some of these systems where you, if you isolate one section, you no longer see how it functions as part of the whole, because of these emergent properties that are only seen in the combinatorial sense, I think you have to be able to agile and move along multiple stages when you can be reductionist and then test it back in the intact system and see if it still holds when you put it back into the complex system. And that may speak to the metal metabolomic approach as at least one component to be able to do that integration and, and cumulative effects. Um, let's open it up. And I, I saw Ellen. Who else has a question? And we'll okay. And we can go to the microphone and. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks very much. And again, this has been a great day. I don't want the session to pass, though, without probably one of the most impactful parts of it from the point of view of somebody who's been studying environmental toxicants in a more or less classical way. And I have to say that um, a, about 10 days ago, one of my students found Tom's paper. And we have all been reading it with a great deal of excitement. And when I emailed them that I was sitting next to him, it was like I was next to a rock star, I said Tom. <laughs> According to my lab, you rock. But we spend a lot of time in my lab looking at a population level 
on the effects of at least two important metals uh, in terms of cardiovascular and cancer. That's arsenic and mercury. We also, along with the rest of the environmental health community, have gotten very fascinated in looking at gene environment interactions for those two metals because we know they undergo transformation, primarily methylation, which we think is important in terms of the toxicity. And there's a NIEHS has funded us and others to look at that. From Tom's data, the small modulation that might be due to the classically defined metabolic pathways is dwarfed by what the microbiome might be doing in handling those metals. And this is huge. It suggests that perhaps our inferences from external exposure sources, be it methylmercury in fish, or arsenate, arsenite in drinking water, to the biomarkers that we measure in the circulation in the urine, we might be completely mixed up because there's that intermediary that is modifying that relationship between the inorganic arsenicals and the organomercurials. So this is absolutely enormous finding that doesn't just relate to bioremediation or bioavailability from soil, Tom, but it's really what's going on between that interface. And it's not just the release from soil, it's what kinds of species are actually getting into the human because we think these make a tremendous difference in the toxicity for chronic disease, particularly of these metals. So I don't want that to go unnoticed. This is a huge thing that has never been thought of before in environmental health sciences, two of our most prevalent and major defined human health risks. And, and it gives new uh, meaning to the concept windows of susceptibility. It may not be a life stage. It may be after a broad spectrum antibiotic course. No, and it may have nothing to do with your genetics, which is what we currently think is the hot topic in metal toxicity. Ellen, are you so you're suggesting, for example, that um, inorganic mercury could be methylated by the human gut flora? Well, Tom's paper points that out, and it could be demethylated. So everything we think is going on between eating fish or working with gold in the Brazilian Amazon, and then we measure things in hair or urine, may be completely messed up. And then we think, as you know from the work of Mike Walkies, in terms of the stage methylation of the arsenic compounds, and we think that you know it's really the arsenate, arsenite, and the drinking water that's the problem, we may be completely messed up on this. And if I can... Um... So I really want to stress the foundational importance of just this for environmental health sciences. Okay, we can and have I'm some limited conversation on this. Is that what you wanted to get to, that's Rita? That's exactly what I wanted okay. to get to. Um, I've had, uh, and my, I'm Rita Shoney, U.S. EPA Office of Water, and have unfortunately spent a lot of time on both mercury, methylated and otherwise, and arsenic, methylated and otherwise. And in general today, I, I've had a, a lot of eureka moments, and in this last session, I had quite a few oh shit moments. <laughs> well, it's on topic too. Oh, sorry. That's right. Shit's a good thing. I'm it's sorry. The same thing. Um, That's where the action is. But it was exactly along the lines of, of, of what you were saying, Ellen. I mean, we know there is some methylation of mercury in the gut, um, and it's demethylated as well. Frankly, any time someone goes against the dogma of um, arsenic um, metabolism in the human and shows me places where um, what we've thought is in terms of a lovely progression of reduction and methylation and more reduction and methylation, um, if, if the bugs choose to do something else, a lot of, of what I have been basing regulation on maybe somewhat, if not, I hate to say flawed, I will not say flawed, but at least there, there's other implications for the way in which we are dealing with, with um, arsenic and other metal species. So um, I was having the same kind of reaction to, to this, these last few presentations. Now I'll go back to Eureka tomorrow. But that would, that would support, what both of you are saying is, would in some way support Steve's concept or Steve's push that many yes. of us are supportive of for the whole exposome yes. concept where you, and again, maybe the need to be looking at what's in the blood more than what's in the urine, for example, because what's in the blood you know is circulating in the body as opposed to what could have happened. Mm -hmm. Although anything that gets 
is coming out in the urine has to have gotten from the gut to the blood to the urine. Yeah, but, well, we haven't talked about other, yeah, microbiomes uh, out through the excretory system. Um, but, you know, there are little signals that things may not be right. Um, there was a paper that just came out of uh, the group in the, uh, Slovenia showing that among fish eaters, there was a surprising amount of inorganic mercury in the blood. And that's because people usually don't look at the blood when you're studying fish eaters, you measure the hair. Um, and so was this speculated that this was maybe some occult exposure to inorganic uh, mercury? Maybe it wasn't, maybe it was microbiome influence within that absorptive excretory pathway. I hope we're not gonna get totally hung up on the gut microbiome. It is fun, but there are other microbiomes that could participate in the handling of chemicals. But I do think this is potentially really important. Good, I've got a queue of people lined up. Um, we're gonna go Trey and then to the microphone, to George and to Lisa, unless Lisa is this well, initially, my question was related to this, too. I think it is important, and I'll just end with that. Uh, very, very interesting. I, I would, since it's been brought up, the, the, the uh, I won't say the nano silver specifically, but just the antimicrobials that are being incorporated into a number of products. Uh, so I think one, uh, and I think Les, you kind of touched on it. Do you think that there will be sort of an adaptation to this? Or can anyone talk about, you know, what may, and I know we're very early in the game, but how the body will adapt to, you know, this increased use of, you know, and not only in food packaging, but you're seeing it in uh, textiles, in uh, plastic matrices like computer mouse. And I guess that goes to sort of my second question, which is what impact, we talked a lot about the gut, but what about the skin? And, you know, we talked about other microbiomes. What impact will it have there? There are resistance genes for several metals that bacteria, you know, have selected for through their primordial encounter with metals and soils. And those are readily transferable in horizontal, um, you know, lateral gene transfer. I was just asking Tom if we knew of any silver resistance uh, genes. I don't know that anybody's ever studied them. There's also, they seem to cross over and that iron and arsenic seem to be able to handle each other. So I would think that if we're using nanoparticles based on metals as biocides, yeah, the, c the community of microbes will handle this pretty quickly. You know, I've got uh, a lot of faith in microbial evolution. So I, I, I'm not worried that, the, that there won't be uh, microbial communities, a adaptation of microbial communities. Uh, but the consequence that has for us is entirely unknown because this, the uh, as I tried to emphasize in my talk, the uh, beneficial effects that we're accustomed to getting from our microbes are not things that we can assume are favored in any uh, selection that's based directly on the microbes or microbial communities themselves. Uh, our mutualism with, uh, with the microbe, and my focus is the gut, but it's true for, for uh, all the different microbial communities that we're host to, to the extent that they're providing mutualist functions. Uh, I think in many cases, uh, the mutualisms that we've come accustomed to are things that have been selected for across uh, many host generations of coast up of coevolution, uh, and so it's an open question: How will a modified microbial community uh, continue or not continue to serve those same functions? Um, Vince, were you going to yeah, answer this to, quickly? To, fo to follow on that, it is true. And again, someone brought up the difference in time scales when most microbial generation times are on the order of minutes to hours at most. When things get tough, evolution on them, they're not going to necessarily wait to see how it affects us during our generation time. So the adaptations to some sudden change, to some sudden serious perturbation on the microbiome, first of all, it's going to happen at the level of the individual bacterium and the individual species, and then perhaps the consortium. And then finally, those effects will have an evolutionary effect on us. But like I said, the microbes aren't going to wait to see how it affects us before they go ahead and change. So. I'm having such fun. This is, this is just 
Uh, hi, Ellen. <laughs> I'm sorry, would you introduce yourself? <laughs> My name is Ann Summers, and I've spent the last 35 years studying microbial metabolism of toxic metals, and including the enzymology, and now more recently the omics type stuff. And I have answers for almost everything that's been brought up, and I can't work my way back through all of those things. But there certainly is silver resistance, and it's been out there for a long time. And it has turned up initially in Burns units, and it remains a problem in Burns units of the heavy selection of using silver sulfidizing. Um, so that, and it is plasmid mediated, and the mechanism has been worked out by other laboratories. Um, but uh, the, many of us are concerned about the. Uh, inroad that, that the silver nanoparticles and so forth are making there. And there are, um, a lot of them are, are, are aiming to be used in clinical settings. And, and at least three or four times, those of us who have worked in the metals business get calls from people who want to know and want to have us be consultants for how they should best use these things in their dressings and their lab coats and their gowns and so forth. And we say, not at all, if possible. Uh, some of them are being very effective when they are used in a very small scale in hospitals. But when they want to go to putting them in every sheet and so forth, and all the, all, all the lab coats and so forth, that's inviting disaster. Uh, as far as adaptation to toxins, um, I, I, I was listing I must, I, at least 10 papers that can answer most of the questions that you've raised here. And I'll be happy to make them available to the panel, but particularly with respect to the rapidity of adaptation. Um, one of our earliest efforts in this regard was to look at the adaptation of the microbial flora of the, the oral flora and uh, the GI tract flora, the, the fecal flora, uh, to the, uh, the installation into a primate model system of dental amalgam fillings, which are 50% mercury and release mercury for their entire lifetime. And uh, it, you see, a, you see uh, the association of that adaptation to mercury with an association of antibiotic multi-resistance, not just single resistances. Uh, the bugs have learned through their experience with human beings over the period of time since amalgam fillings were introduced, and then later on the time when antibacterial therapy was introduced, to put these things together on some very ancient infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, if you will, that they have uh, called mobile genetic elements. And they've assembled them together, and it's uncanny and unfortunate but the most widely found example of the mercury resistance locus is on something that is next to what's called an integron. And oh, all right, I'm getting nods from over there, so I assume people can hear me talking in lecture hall, 300 people mode here. With so, um, but is on a on a, a genetic device, a very ancient genetic device called an integron that puts in randomly antibiotic resistance genes and any kind of combination can switch them around and provides them with a promoter in case they don't have one of their own. It's just amazing stuff. And the mercury resistance locus, most widely found mercury resistance locus in the Enterobacteriaceae and other proteobacteria has and carries an integron of multiple antibiotic resistance. So if you have, if you have silver fillings, uh, you are continually selecting for, and we showed this in an animal model, eight different uh, eight different monkeys, uh, that you have persistence of antibiotic resistance as long as the fillings were in the animal. Now, that's that connection with antibiotic resistance, the metabolism that bacteria who live in the gut who do this carry out with mercury. They are demethylators. They are reducers. They, they mediate an enterohepatic cycle of mercury. Um, and that, that um, has not technically been documented with isotopic studies. But the biochemistry is all there, and the permeability to HG0 is all there. That was done in the lung. <clears throat> um, there's that piece. Um, epidemiologically speaking, um, we're very concerned about this because of the impact that it may make on uh, understanding things like SNPs being associated with different diseases and not really being able to work that out very well uh, because perhaps of the overlying Im impact of the back, uh, not the bacteria, but of the mercury itself on, on the um, um, human metabolism. But, but the bacteria are players in there because they keep the mercury going around and they also do this antibiotic resistance stuff. But I wanted to say, with respect to the exposure to mercury, it is quite widespread from this particular source, much more so and much more heavily from amalgam than from anything that you get from fish. And I will say that the fish is complicated chemistry uh, and, and complicated toxicology. Uh, so yes, it, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say there's a distinction, and I can speak to that if you want to. However, with respect to amalgam mercury, the, net, the, the newly analyzed NHANES data that Mark Richardson uh, from Canada has reanalyzed 
uh, just recently, and he has a paper coming out on that, which he presented at an FDA meeting in December, um, shows that in terms of the exposure in the United States to multi-surface silver fillings, um, at least a quarter and possibly as much as a third of the U.S. population is regularly and chronically exposed to mercury as mercuric mercury at a level that exceeds the EPA's tolerance level, uh, national EPA uh, or, <coughs> or Cal, Cal EPA, which were the two benchmarks. And um, so it's a very widespread phenomenon. We may, most of us think, oh, they don't have those kind of fillings anymore, but they do. So that's, I'll quit, and if, you, if there are other questions I can answer, um, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. That's a lot of very good information. Um, and and you, you raised something that actually I was going to ask, which is in, in studying antimicrobial resistance, there was a lot of, it wasn't about the ribosomal DNA. It's all, it was all about plasmids and, and movable small bits of, uh, of genetic material in these bacteria, which if I'm understanding it, our metagenomic techniques completely miss these. Um, and we would need to be doing some other kind of, you know, it may be showing up, and I, I'm not exactly sure how we're doing these functional huge assays. Yes. Um, I'm sure there's, a, there's an answer there, but I, I don't want to divert that, but I, no, I, no, I, there I'm are, glad that you there are meta methods for measuring plasmids. No, okay. there absolutely are methods of measuring them, but I'm saying when we do these species identifying oh, studies yeah. of yeah. 20,000 yeah. in these graphs yeah. that we've seen, they're not capturing the plasma DNA, they're looking at the ribosomal DNA absolutely. to do species identification, right. that's all. That's right. Um, Margaret, you had had a, an, something that you wanted to raise? Okay, I, I, no, I, I was cutting off because I thought we had other people. Anybody? Raise your standing up for stretching purposes. Okay, I'll throw my hat into the ring. Mike Broder, EPA. Um, based on what I've seen in the last couple of papers, we basically at EPA have relied on animal studies when we have access to do that. And what we do is uh, usually rely on either feeding studies, gavage studies, something of that nature. One of the early papers that, we, uh, that was presented talked about the diversity in the gut microflora between the different species. Yes, there are similarities there, but by and large, they tend to be different. My question then goes back to, given the differences in the gut flora, how relevant are these feeding studies or gavage studies for evaluating toxicity of chemicals, uh, specifically the PBPK, that we don't take into consideration when we apply animal data to human risk assessments? I see a number of people I, rising I, to... Not, uh, can I respond to that? I'm not a regular anymore. So I can't directly, but accept that if, if you use the appropriate conversion to compare animal to human data, you're looking at something like blood levels. And in fact, so that would take care of differential metabolism. That assumes that you have the PBPK data, that kind of data, as opposed to just looking at the endpoint. Margaret, did you want to? Yeah, <clears throat> I would say it would depend upon whether or not you're asking about basic prin principles underlying how these, these things work, or if you're asking about a specific response to a specific thing. Um, in other words, I think both are needed. I think we, we need to understand the rules of the game and how animals interact with microbes, and I don't think we know those rules. And so I think that's one set of questions you know, independent of, you know, what animal you're using. But if you're asking some about some specific um, response, I don't even know whether or not, you know, the fact that only, it was a surprise that only nine of the 1,700 genes were mammalian genes. Um, it seems to me that mammals are pretty similar. <laughs> so, Les, did you want to answer that or you're saying? Yeah, I, uh, my short answer to the question is, uh, a lot like Margaret's, but, but fundamentally, we don't know. We don't even know from one strain to another, uh, or one vendor to another, of mouse or rat, whether the uh, microbes that are different in those systems are going to have a, a fundamental difference in the, in the outcomes. And so, uh, we, I mean, I suppose we could just all throw up our hands and go home, but uh, it probably isn't the, the best response. I think we need to start making the measurements, though, so that just like people realize, well, you need to, to know what strain of mouse, mouse you're working on, and you need to know the genotype uh, you know, of the, the people you are studying. And if there's known 
alleles that affect the phenomenon, we're going to just need to start keeping track of the microbes in the same way. And as the point was just raised, it doesn't just mean the 16S ribosomal uh, DNA approach, which will let you know a handful of species. Uh, but increasingly, we're going to have to say, well, here are known pathways, uh, microbial pathways that we can identify functional genes for. And we're going to want to measure the activity level of those pathways uh, in the studies. You know, at the same time, we're measuring other outcomes that we think are relevant for regulation. And, and we do have some of that technology. For example, work going on in the Gordon lab right now, where they are taking mice and reconstituting their microbiota with sequenced, with only species that have sequenced genomes and that are of human origin, at least initially. And so you can imagine with that type of approach. Now that that doesn't address the question of, okay, is this bug in a mouse going to behave the same way as it does in a human? Is it going to interact with the mouse the same way as the human or all the other higher order interactions? But at least for a first approximation, you can start with systems like that. And there is an acceptance. When I first told immunologists, well, yeah, I know you're all using the same knockout mouse on the same genetic background, but shouldn't we know about the microbiota? They look at me like, yeah, as if we would ever care about that. And that's why when that paper from Lidman came out, I, couple of my friends like that, I did say, hey, maybe you should care because now it's an immunologist saying it's important, <laughs> not a microbiologist <laughs> saying it's important. So, you know, I mean, with technology, with careful design, you know, we, the more we know, the more we have to consider, but you can't consider everything every time unless you tie yourself up in knots. So what we have to do is we have to push, try something, see if it's appropriate for the application that we want. And it's much like the sequencing technology. When we had all these great, now that we have all of these great sequencers, you know, it's when you have a good hammer, everything looks like a nail. But when you hit a screw enough times with a hammer, you break it, right? So again, it's the kind of things we have to kind of be a little bit more careful and circumspect. It's great to have all of the enthusiasm. And I have as much enthusiasm as everybody else. But occasionally, I have to back up and say, OK, now, does that really make sense to keep on doing this just because we can, because we have this nice new tool? Bill, I'm going to. I'm sure there are more questions. In fact, I have a few, but I'm going to end it. We've gone over time and let uh, Dr. Farland have the last word. Well, I was, I was just going to jump in on this last point. And I, I think it's important that we not forget about the fact that we've got a rich database on the way that animals respond to chemicals and other types of, of toxicants. And whether it's species differences or same species in different institutions by different investigators over time, um, there may very well be effects of the microbiome that we need to be taking into account. Those are going to be important for us to think about. But at this point, we can't turn our, our uh, toxicology over on its head uh, thinking that we've missed a lot of things. So that's something that we have to look at. So I'll stop there.